um, to our VMOL seminar. Um, now we've had a few of these um, so far for the quarter. Um, so we're really excited to see you all again. Um, today also, um, we're lucky to have um, Professor Erin Baker with us. Um, so Erin received her BS in chemistry with a minor in mathematics, actually from Montana State University. Um, and she actually performed undergrad research um, in ion mobility, which she'll be talking about today. Uh, from there, she's gone on to become like one of the world's foremost experts in ion mobility. Um, she pursued this during her PhD um, at University of California um, in Santa Barbara, um, where she looked at uh, biological molecules, um, DNA duplexes and quadruplexes. And then she went on to do her postdoc and um, she was also a scientist at Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, and now she is at UNC where she runs her group. Um, and today she'll be talking about ion mobility, which she has, um, yeah, tons of, uh, which she's she's um, written tons of publications about uh, that. So very excited to have her here. And um, yeah, let's, I'll see what she has to say. Awesome. Thanks so much, Allegra, and thanks, Daniel, um, so much for the invitation to talk. I'm really excited to talk to you guys today, and I'll try and keep you entertained since uh, I know Zoom meetings can be boring <laughs> sometimes, but uh, I've got some fun fun things to sh pepper in so to keep you entertained. So if you don't get anything out of this, I'll, I'll, I'll key on, on the key points and say, you need to remember this, right? <laughs> so let me share my screen. There we go. And so today I just, I'm going to talk about ion mobility like Allegra and Daniel asked me to, but I want to actually talk about how we're applying it also so that you can see that we're using it to link chemical exposure to human health. And I'm going to get rid of some of these or hide this a little floating meeting control just so it's easier to see. But um, so that we so like Allegra said, I always like to show this, especially for students, to show that you don't need to know what you're going to do today. Um, when I was in grad school, when I finished, I said, I never want to be an academic PI. That was, <laughs> that was like the least thing. I would uh, TA'd and like the students were always mad at my advisor because they didn't think he taught very well. So I just get to hear them yell at me about how they didn't enjoy his teaching. And I was just like, this is miserable. <laughs> so I just wanted to go and do research and hide behind my instrument. And so this is me hiding behind one of my instruments. And I'm a little bit introverted too. And so I think figured if I got a job in chemistry, I wouldn't have to talk to anybody. I could just hide, do my data, get my results, and everybody would just leave me alone. And then I got into the workforce, and they're like, yeah, you have to present your results because we have to know what you're doing, and you have to write all of this. And so I've definitely morphed in the years of like becoming extroverted when I need to, but then still being able to go hide behind my instruments if I want. Um, but I grew up in a cattle ranch in Montana, and I always like to show this because everybody has such distinct backgrounds, and so don't ever let your background limit you to what you can do. And then headed to Montana State and UC Santa Barbara. I'd never lived outside of Montana when I went to Santa Barbara, and these are two amazingly beautiful campuses if you guys have never been there. And I know where you guys are at are, is amazingly beautiful too, but um, UC Santa Barbara is, the chemistry department's a quarter of a mile from the beach. So there'd be times at lunch where we would go down to the beach and kind of just clear your brain and then go back to the lab, which was pretty cool. Then I worked at PNNL, um, which out of all the places I'd been is probably the ugliest of them. <laughs> and so um, a lot of people think that Pacific Northwest National Lab, because it's in Washington, is in a beautiful area. It's by Seattle, big mountains. They actually put it in the um, bottom corner be kind of close to Oregon and Idaho. So it's the far east bottom corner because that was where the Manhattan Project or the Hanford site was for building the bombs in the 1940s. And so the National Lab came from that as they helped do a lot of the chemical assessments of what was going on at the Hanford site. So you can see here that there's a river flowing by, that's the Columbia River, and they put the Hanford site near the Columbia River 
because they needed to cool the nuclear reactors. So they wanted it in a very isolated area to cool the nuclear reactors with the rivers. And then they actually bought out the land from the people and actually made them move away. Um, so it's a very interesting place, but you can see around the National Lab has beautiful trees because uh, everything can be irrigated from the river. And so the only green spots are from the irrigation, everything else is sagebrush and brown. But I was there for 13 years and I worked as a senior research scientist and I, I loved what I was doing, but I loved working with the students. And when the economy goes down, the national labs don't bring on the postdocs. And so I missed working with the students. So I decided to go try my hand at academia, even though I decided you know, 15 years prior that I was never gonna do that. And so I headed to NC State first. And so I worked at NC State for four years. But um, I wasn't able to get the infrastructure I needed to grow my group. So they only allowed me to use the core structure to do our analyses. And because we do a lot of trace anal analysis, people would come before and contaminate the instruments. So my students would take weeks to clean up the instruments so we could do what we were doing. And it just um, didn't work. And so they weren't able to give me the lab space I needed for the more toxic analyses. And so then I was able to get that at UNC. So I've been at UNC since August of 2022, but you can see my path is not straight and I have no idea where I'll go in the future. <laughs> I just, uh, I'm always open to new opportunities, um, but I'm really enjoying what I'm doing right now. So hopefully, hopefully this is a good match for now, but just know that you don't have to decide your future today. It makes sure that you're enjoying what you're doing and you change along the way if you're not. And so my research interests have always kind of been in three areas. I always wondered, you know, why is a person sick? How should the person be treated? And can we detect diseases before a person becomes symptomatic? And that led me to kind of this world of ohms, where there's uh, proteomics and lipidomics and metabolomics. And can we do blood tests and tell you that you have early signs of a cancer before you even have a tumor? And um, I did a lot of that work at PNNL and found it really fascinating. But we really started looking at the importance of xenobiotics too. And so those are molecules that you're exposed to that you don't usually even know you're being exposed to. So things in the air from pollution that you're breathing in, things in your water where a chemical company might be contaminating your water and you're drinking that every time you have your 16 ounces of water per day. Um, just how do these xenobiotics also affect your other endogenous metabolites and endogenous molecules? But when you start doing all these different ohms, you have to start thinking about the data analysis too, because we want to bring the results together. But it can be really difficult because you've got results from one area and results from another area. So my group also does a lot of work with artificial intelligence and machine learning to try and bring the different ohms together. And so we kind of have this umbrella term. And so you always kind of have to have a catchphrase when new students want to join your group of what you do. And so ours is, um, our goal is to link chemical exposure and human health. And that allows us to do a lot of really cool things. So we can create and optimize analytical techniques. And that's where our ion mobility comes in. And I'll be showing you later. Um, but we do these multi-omic analyses and then try and link them together to see if we see a certain, you know, 10 lipids changing in our lipidomics studies, do we see five proteins that are changing that could be why those lipids are changing? So we try to correlate those. We develop software. So if you're young, learn how to code. It is so valuable. And even if you're not young, like I, I even code on this or try to learn the different codings on the side because everything is going to so much automation and to be able to control the computations with that is hugely important now and will be even more so in the future. And then we do a lot of work with high throughput screenings, which is based on the ion mobility that I'll talk to you guys about too. And so thinking of our overarching goal though of connecting chemical exposure and human health, the main reason this has really been brought forth is when they finished the Human Genome Project, they found that over 90% of diseases are not due to your genetics. And they'd hoped that there were more so that basically you could take your genome and say, 
oh, you know, I have propensity for this specific type of cancer based on my genes. Um, what can I do, you know, throughout my life that'll keep that at bay? And they found certain ones, though. You can think of BRCA for breast cancer. And so if women see that, they know that they're at really high level risk for having breast cancer. But there's only certain certain genes like that. And so we know now that there's a lot more influence on the environment that we're in that causes our bodies to start having problems as we age. And we can think that can come from our diet. So whether you eat McDonald's every day and have your cheeseburger and your French fries, or if you try to be super good and you're eating your salads, but maybe those are sprayed down with pollutants and you didn't wash your lettuce. And so every time you have your nice salad and your tomatoes, you're just filling yourself full of pesticides. The other thing is we have to take certain drugs. So not even just recreational drugs, but sometimes you have an infection and those antibiotics can wipe out all the bacteria in your gut. And so how does that gut bacteria come back and get you your gut health again? And then the one that always scares me is just our exposure based on our cosmetics. And so uh, I'm putting a shampoo in my hair and conditioner in my hair. And sometimes I like a little mousse. And then I brush my teeth with tooth, uh, different types of toothpaste. What am I actually doing to myself that I don't even think about? So all of these different xenobiotics are going into our body and they actually get metabolized. So your body sees them as molecules it wants to break down and so brings those through um, metabolomic pathways. And so that affects your gut microbiota. So our poor little bacteria down there, but it also affects your endogenous metabolism. So your normal molecules, your glucoses and your other things are going through their metabolism. But then you pop in something that's some kind of nasty toxicant in with that glucose, like trying to break down. And you can say that you collect this all in your metabolome. But when we look at our keg pathway, then we're pulling out lipids, proteins, glycans, all kinds of different things that could be affected by how these molecules are breaking down and how they're um, circulating in our bodies, we often say that our blood is uh, basically the sewer system of our body because our cells are basically um, communicating and dropping things that they don't want into your blood. So basically dropping their sewage into your blood system, everything's circulating and your blood is, um, I think it's a really interesting matrix, but sometimes it's not as specific as you'd like it to be because you could have an infection or you could have a tumor or you could have a tumor and an infection and how they convolute can be difficult to figure out. So a lot of people in analytical chemistry will do direct measurements of the xenobiotics you're exposed to by, you know, collecting bags of air and looking what's in the air, looking at your water and seeing what you're exposed to. And then you can also do these indirect measurements where you're looking at the other specific omics and how those are being altered by those xenobiotics that you're exposed to. And my group tries to do both of these because we think, and this goes back to our big data, we think that understanding both what a person's exposed to and then oh, the indirect measurements of how that exposure is causing changes to the other molecules is going to be really important for really understanding a lot of these changes in your pathways or your human health. And so I always like to acknowledge these guys right off. So this is my lab. Um, they're the ones that work really hard when I get to run around and give really cool talks in places. And we do all kinds of different omics. And so the color around each person is the omic that they specialize in with the key in the middle. So we do a lot of exposomics and lipidomics and metabolomics currently, and then kind of proteomics on the side. But um, I'm not sure uh, you guys' background in analytical chemistry, but to do the different omic measurements, a lot of people will do some kind of chromatography. So a liquid chromatography that does a polarity separation. So whether the molecules dissolve in water or not, or a boiling point type of separation for gas chromatography. Um, and then they take it and do mass spectrometry to put the components together and figure out what are the molecules that you're seeing and then which ones um, fragment in certain ways. And that gives us confidence in the molecules that we're identifying because a lot of these small molecules can map back to hundreds of molecules with the same or very similar um, mass values. But what we do is we actually use ion mobility in a, it, with both of those, we couple it in between those because we want even more confidence in the molecules that we're seeing and that we're getting true 
identifications for what people are being exposed to and what molecules are actually changing in their body. So the cool thing about ion mobility is it's very fast. So it's a gas phase based separation. And so um, based on I don't know what you know about mass spectrometry, but if we think about mass spectrometry and we have this tube here, with mass spectrometry, we want to get rid of all of these little blue molecules because that's going to interfere with our analytes as we send them through the tube. And we want the least number of interactions and the longest mean free path. And so we'd send our molecules through, they'd hit the detector without any of these little blue daubs, and you would get to get a specific mass for each of your molecules. If they hit any other molecules, that affects the value that you would see for their mass. With ion mobility, this technique, mass spectrometry was discovered in the late 1800s, and so was ion mobility. So these techniques have been around for over 100 years. And um, with ion mobility, they said, OK, with mass spectrometry, if we pump all of the blue molecules out, um, we get really nice long mean free paths. What, but what happens if we actually fill that tube with buffer gas? And so that's the blue is to show buffer gas molecules. And so we try to find something really inert, like a helium or nitrogen gas. And then we put, we basically have a race of our different molecule types through that nitrogen gas. And so we'll pulse the molecules in and the molecules that are smaller in a surface area will have less collisions and will get through the buffer gas faster. So this isn't a mass separation, this is a size separation. So here, if we pulse these two different molecules into the drift tube, we can see that the one that, that's more ring-based gets through faster than the one that's more linear. And we get a drift time separation for our molecules where we can say, in mass spectrometry, these guys had the exact same M over Z value, but now by adding ion mobility to it, I can see that the atoms are arranged in different ways. And so that one M over Z actually corresponds to two different isomers in my analysis. And these two different isomers have completely different properties. So um, it's very important to be able to distinguish that we have these two in uh, the different samples that we're looking at. The other nice thing with ion mobility is you get this constant velocity based on how the molecules are being pulled through, which is through a weak electric field, because we have to have, if we don't pull them through with anything, they just sit at the top of the um, the drift cell and not want to move through, but we pull them through with that weak electric field, they get this constant velocity so that we can work with others throughout the world and compare our drift times and something that we I'm going to call a collision cross section with the uh, um, other people and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So the nice thing about ion mobility, though, is that we can do it in a millisecond time scale. So we can get this structural separation usually in about 20 milliseconds. So very, very fast because it's in this gas phase. And because it's so fast, we can put it after our chromatography separations and then before our mass spectrometry separations. And then you get three dimensional information for every sample that we run. We also get this ion neutral collision cross section value. And what that looks like is on this right side, you can see the analyte. We have this little sphere around it. That's its interaction with the nitrogen gas that we use. And so that gives it a, a basically a surface area of what we're seeing. And as long as we're using a similar pressure and temperature in our drift gas compared to others in the industry, we can compare those collision cross-section values because it basically normalizes the drift times for everybody to a specific surface area. It allows us to run standards and make these giant libraries so that when people run ion mobility, they can match to the library and see if the molecules match some of the standards that we've run in our analyses. And then it also has many benefits for doing omic analyses. So um, everything I'm going to show, we're using liquid chromatography as a front end separation, then ion mobility spectrometry, and then mass spectrometry. So all these multiple dimensions. And then with mass spectrometry, we're also doing fragmentation. So we also, we actually call it a four dimensional analysis of each sample. But because liquid chromatography takes the longest, you can think of it as a nesting doll. Everything has to be a smaller nesting doll after that or take less time than liquid chromatography. So that if something coming through liquid chromatography has a 10 second peak, with ion mobility, we sample that peak every few hundred milliseconds or maybe every 60 milliseconds. And then in mass spectrometry, we sample that in a microsecond time scale. So you each spot has multiple other spots that have been 
been sampling it. And so that looks like this. It looks very crazy and nasty. <laughs> and so you'd have your one dimension with your retention time. So we'd have our peaks if you could see an intensity dimension. But within our, in our intensity dimension, we see all of these different masses. And we have each mass has a specific drift time going through the ion mobility instrument. And that's where ion mobility has been kind of slow for adoption because the data is so complex when you get into some of these samples like blood or like uh, like saliva. We, we, we do all kinds of things. We do stool samples, saliva samples, air samples, water samples, and they're not all this complex. This, is, this would be a blood sample. But um, people didn't know how to analyze it. So we've been working a lot on how to develop softwares and different things that I'm going to show you guys to actually utilize the ion mobility dimension. Another thing I always like to show is while this looks crazy, we've still had to bias every analysis that we do because a lot of times we have to do some kind of extraction for the molecules that we're interested in. So if we want to do proteomics, we have to extract out the proteins away from the lipids and the other small molecules. So now we're not going to get those. Then we pick a chromatography column for the molecules we're interested in. So that biases again. Then we'll pick an ionization source. So a lot of people like to use electrospray ionization for those. And so that gives you another bias. And then the ion mobility and the mass spectrometry luckily don't bias too much, but mass spectrometry, we have to pick a specific M over Z range for the molecules that we wanna see come out. So you could run for each sample, you could do different extractions, different ionizations, different chromatographies, and this could be multiplied by X, you know, to try and get as much comprehensive knowledge as possible. So there's been a lot of work to make these molecular databases and the collision cross-section libraries. And so John McLean's group out of Vanderbilt University has done a great amount of work for that, where he has a library called the um, Collision CCS Compendium. And he has over 3,800 metabolites in there that his group has run. And then my group has compared a lot of these different molecules and we see less than 1% difference in the CCS values that he, pr he provided from Vanderbilt versus what we see at UNC. So that's pretty cool is there's very little error even on different instruments in different states in different areas and gives us a lot of hope that we can uh, we can just keep adding and anytime that somebody adds a new molecule, then we can just make this really big compendium. Um, my group's done metabolites, acyl carnitines, lipids, bile acids, and then um, we're really getting into the xenobiotics. And so we're doing PFAS and also working with a group at Texas A&M to do the ToxCash chemicals, which are, which is a database from EPA where they provide standards for over 4,600 chemicals. We're seeing ionization about half of those to 75%, but some of them are just like, um, iron or things that won't work with mass spectrometry. But what this looks like for this data is, so this would be LC IMS MS data. And it's hard to visualize everything like I showed in that multi-dimension. So I'm just gonna show you it to you in two dimensions, usually snapshots. So in liquid chromatography, this is what our sample looked like. Um, and then, but we also have all those other dimensions hidden in this information. And so if we know that the molecule we're interested in came out at 22 minutes, we can select a slice for that peak and we can do a one second slice. And then we get something like this when we look at our ion mobility and our mass spec information. So here our mass spec information is on our X axis and you can see our mass spectra here for our M over Z values. And then our ion mobility information is on the Y axis. And so for every single M over Z, we have a specific dot of if we saw it in that drift time or not. The coolest thing about this though, is that we can go in even further and say, well, the molecule that I'm specifically interested in should come out at about 43 milliseconds. Then we can slice and get rid of anything else that could interfere in our mass spectrum and say, oh, look at how clean we get rid of basically all the noise. And here we spiked in a stable isotope labeled molecule that matched that standard. And so that means that we have a C13 version. This one had six heavy labeled carbons on it. And we can see that that spiking level was almost equivalent to what we're seeing in our native sample so that our native molecule is almost the same as what our spiked molecule was. 
And so the thing I want you guys to see here, though, is that um, if we take ion mobility and we take mass spectrometry and we plot these together, we get specific trend line relationships. And this is where we've really used it for a lot of our exposure work. And what this is also another John McLean paper from 2008, where he showed that at a specific M over Z, smaller molecules are more packed. So the smaller collision cross sections are more packed in a tighter way. So you can see here that if we had an M over Z of 1000, our first collision cross sections we're going to run into at the lower values are going to be nucleotides and carbohydrates which are ring-based type of molecules, where if our collision cross-section keeps getting bigger, we're more into more linear type of molecules. And so that's really important because when we do our studies, if we get a certain feature out, meaning that we have the M over Z and the CCS value, and it comes right here, I can say that the backbone is something in between a lipid and a peptide, and it gives us more information on what an unknown molecule might be. And so my group did the same as um, John's group is we kept getting all these standards and we kept running them and we got the same relationship as him is that these more ring based molecules have lower collision cross sections per M over Z. But we really wanted to define the small molecule area of like, are we still seeing these relationships or do we see different relationships when we look at xenobiotics and other types of small molecules? So we got another 1500 standards and ran those. And so just a small snapshot because 1500 dots is a lot. Um, what we did, we saw really unique relationships where again, we saw our nucleotides and our nucleosides for our smaller molecules were at lower collision cross-section values than our um, fatty acids. But we also saw unique relationships like our bile acids that all have this steroid backbone and just different hydroxyl positions or numbers of hydroxies have more of a flat based slope for those. And it was really interesting to see as we'd introduce new molecule types, how those would overlay in this area. But what really brought us to more toxin analysis was looking at some of these halogenated molecules like the polybrominated diphenyl ethers. So here, those have bromines and their line is coming below our most compact hydrogenated molecule. And so what we figured out was that bromine has a lot more mass. So bromine is usually 79 or 81 Daltons. So if we replace a hydrogen with a bromine, we shift a ton on the M over Z side, but we don't shift that same amount going up in the collision cross section side. So because this is 79 Daltons more, but it's not 79 times more the structural size of a hydrogen. So it gives us a new halogenated area to look for our molecules, which is really cool because now we have a different trend line that we can start looking for exposure type molecules. So that's what brought us to the world of PFAS. And so that's what I'm going to show you guys today of some of our recent work using ion mobility to really um, dive into PFAS analysis is that um, PFAS are poly and perfluoroalkyl substances, and they're all man-made. And so these were created back in the 1940s at the Manhattan Project when they were doing the plutonium and the uranium enrichment. They also had this byproduct of PFAS. And... Um, what they found out is they were fluorinated aliphatics, so they're um, anything with CF2, and then you can have R groups or other CF2 groups, but currently there's over 14,000 known or predicted PFAS molecules, so which is pretty scary, 14,000 man-made substances, and there's thought to be many, many more. But what was what they really enjoyed about them is that they were chemically inert and thermally stable. So thermally stable, meaning that the environment doesn't break them down. And you have your UV light and these guys are very robust and um, they're chemically inert and they are very hydrophobic. They don't like water. And so basically when we think about our raincoats, we can put a PFAS coating on them and that makes it so that the water doesn't seep into our clothes. And so some of the things we think about are Teflon pans. So this was some of the first big applications of PFAS is non-stick um, coatings in pans. But basically we're lining our pans with man-made chemicals and we don't know any of the toxic effects yet. Um, you can also think of Scotchgard and Gore-Tex use a ton of PFAS in their different products to keep us dry and to keep carpets from staining. Uh, the one that's kind of scary is in uh, food applications of so uh, dessert and bread wrappers. 
of PFAS. And so down here is the percentage of fluorine in these different fast food or regular food containers. So you can see that they're in our burger and our sandwich wrappers, our paper boards for our French fries. But luckily, we're not seeing it in the paper cups from different sources such as Starbucks. And one that really scared my students because they'd always do their one o'clock microwave popcorn was the inside of popcorn bags is coated with PFAS to basically so that when you pop your popcorn, the grease doesn't seep through the paper and get your microwave dirty or your hands dirty. So a lot of these are convenience-based products. And then another huge um, area where PFAS are found are in firefighting foams. And so you guys might hear the word AFFF for aqueous film forming foams is uh, PFAS work very well in helping with chemical fires. And so because they're very thermally stable, they don't like to break down. And so it's becoming a global contamination issue where the PFAS are moving all throughout our environment and they're very ubiquitous. And the other bad thing is in your bodies, they're bio very bioaccumulative. There's certain um, PFAS analytes that they're seeing last in your body with half-lives of four to eight years. And so once you eat them or ingest them through your water, they're there for a long time. And so that's why people are really worried about them because every time um, somebody has an exposure, it just keeps adding on top of the last one that you had. And there's all kinds of different health effects. So they're linked to increased thyroid disease, cancer risk, liver damage, immune system suppression, and increased cholesterol. There's also a lot of linkage to infertility with PFAS too. And so just to show you guys a few structures, so legacy PFAS, so those ones from the 1940s looked a lot like this. So they were um, eight carbon chains. So this is PFOS and PFOA are two that you'll often hear. The O stands for octanoic, or, and that's where the eight comes from. And then the per means that every carbon has two fluorines at least on it. If you see the poly, that just means that those fluorines are interspersed throughout the molecule. And then sulfonic acid is your head group of sulfonic acid here. And this one's a carboxylic acid head group. So you hear your octanoic acid. And so because of the concerns though that have been going on, um, PFOA and PFOS have been voluntarily phased out by many people. It's not regular, they're not required to be phased out though, but a lot of chemical industries have tried to get rid of them and instead move to more emerging PFAS that they hope will break down faster. And so you'll see that these ones have ether linkages where they hope that like UV exposure would break the ether linkage and they might have more branching. Um, but this chemical called Gen X is really big in North Carolina and people are really concerned about it because uh, it's showing that it's almost as toxic as some of these um, legacy based PFAS. And so going back to our analytical chemistry though, what we found with our ion mobility when we do the M over Z versus the CCS is that PFAS have their own unique trend line because of this high amount of fluorination. And fluorine for us with mass has a mass of 19 Daltons. And so every time we replace a hydrogen by 19 Daltons, we just keep shifting on the M over Z area. And so a molecule that would be hydrogenated here that would be have a similar mass has 12 carbons, 23 hydrogens, and two oxygens, where our PFAS molecule only has four carbons. So right away, we can already see it's way, way shorter and just those nine fluorines. So completely different type of structure and the structural separation works great for PFAS. We also can see in this area down here, we're seeing a lot of our hydrogen or halogens. So we get our PBDEs with our bromine, our PCBs with our chlorines. A lot of them are falling below our more hydrogenated molecules. And so our goal then is um, currently a lot of the studies that are done are target based where people will say, we know these 20 chemicals are really nasty. We're gonna look for those in water. Um, and then we're gonna see how much is present. But um, manufacturers can be tricky and just uh, synthetic byproducts can be tricky of sometimes what you think is bad, the industry will change the molecules up a little bit and you won't see those anymore, but maybe you just add one chlorine to a PFAS and it moves it from your targeted list. So we're doing these non-targeted analyses where basically we look for any features in that PFAS trend line that could have um, 
different links to health effects and then try and inform the targeted analyses of this is another chemical you should add to the targeted list and start looking for in these different samples. We've been doing a lot of work like this with fish in our rivers because fish unfortunately just suck in contaminants and so you'll look at fish and you'll see in their fillets that they'll have really, really high levels of toxic molecules. And so in our um, our non-targeted PFAS discovery workflow, what we do is we do that LC ion mobility mass spec and we get all the features, the different um, information for those different dimensions. Then we do this something called mass defect filtering that I didn't go into. And so we'll just kind of bypass that. But so one type of filtering, but then we do that CCS filtering where we look specifically for molecules in the trend line. And then we also do a homologous series. So if we add more CF2 groups, we just look at the difference between one CF2 group and two CF2 groups and three CF2 groups. And finally, take all of these formula assignments try and like put those on a suspect screening or compare those to other libraries out there, which are PubChem, ToxCast, Norman, and try and figure out if we're seeing novel PFAS. And so this is some data just to show you that's kind of cool is, um, this is a PFAS. Um, with ion mobility, when we fragment afterwards, all of its little fragments line up. And so we can see, basically we can break it apart and then use the puzzle pieces to put it back together. And this is super helpful for unknowns because if we don't know what the structure should be, then we can try and see which, um, which of these fragments links together. And the ion mobility is super powerful because without this drift time filtering of selecting this certain area, we get a lot of contamination. But with the drift time filtering, we get rid of things like this that belong to other molecules. So that's why we really like the ion mobility is the capability to get rid of other interferences. So I'm going to show you guys a few examples over the last um, 10 minutes of my talk, just where we're looking in the environment, trying to monitor different things, um, and then it really trying to go into human health and met metabolic effects using this non-targeted approach. And so one application which has been really fun is we're making aquatic passive samplers. And so you guys don't have to be millionaires to do research. This is kind of a fun project where we just took embroidery hoops that were made out of rubber. And then we took liquid chromatography packing, uh, uh, like stationary phase. So anything C18 or something that you would put in your chromatography and then kept those in with nylon mesh on the outside and then attached a little rope to them and hooked them to buoys. And so we would drop them in different parts of rivers or waters where we were interested if there was um, different chemicals. We were either even looking at like red to green algal blooms and at like what would come from those. And uh, but it ended up that these were dropped below the floral chemical manufacturer because we we're interested in this river. And if we were seeing pollutants below the floral chemical manufacturer, and then we had some above the floral chemical manufacturer so we could see what was present uh, above and below. And so with that non-targeted workflow, though, we found that there were 57 fluorinated features below the fluorochemical manufacturer that we didn't see in this lake up here. And the reason we were really interested in this lake is it's the water source for 700,000 people in the Raleigh area. So we also saw um, 20 different PFAS in it, though. So it's, it's not clean. It just didn't have some of the crazy ones that we were seeing below. And when we compared to libraries, 36 of the PFAS were, un or were known, but 21 of these were unknown. So we really wanted to dive in and see if we could figure out what those unknowns were. So we we called ourselves kind of little detectives. And so using that non-targeted workflow though, we found 14 unique molecular formulas and we're able to propose 11 structures. And so an example of this would be that homologous series. And so here there's a molecule that was available to purchase, which is PFISA. And we would take our liquid chromatography and our mass spectrometry information and we would plot it to see how it landed. And so then a homologous series is we add one CF2, which we were seeing in our mass spectrum. So on this side for this chain, so you can see there's one extra CF2 group. And so we saw the uh, information for that, but then we found two more novel PFAS that were just another CF2 and another CF2. And then they lined up really well in our different analytical techniques. So we had a high confidence, even though there's no standards currently available, there's only about 200 standards available for these 14,000 PFAS. So we try and do any tricks we can to find more of them. 
Um, but then we could actually go back to the EPA and say, we're seeing new chemicals in this water. And these are the ones that we're getting based on the information from our non-targeted workflow. We also do correlation diagrams. And so this goes more into a lot of our statistical analysis where we put all the molecules that we know, and then we compare them to the ones that we don't know that we're interested in finding. So here we'll slice out some of those legacy PFAS I showed you with PFOA and PFOS. We could see that there were methylated versions that also had the same trends in these uh, passive samplers below and above that area. We also looked into these emerging ether areas. And so here we saw Nathium byproduct too, but we saw three other features that had the same kind of trend as Nathium byproduct too. And then when we started assigning molecular formulas, we could see that the molecular formulas were very similar. And by using that MSMS and breaking things, we could actually give a proposed structure for compound eight and compound nine. But for unknown three, we could give it a a molecular formula, but it didn't have good fragments, and so we can't give it a proposed structure. So we've been using this in different studies. So we did a study with pine needles where we used them as passive samplers. And so we found out that pine needles, if you guys pull them off, they have a really waxy kind of outside. You can actually scratch it off with your fingernail. And that waxy cuticle protects the inside of the needle for the tree to grow and be healthy. But that wax is super handy because it traps all kinds of um, atmospheric pollutants. And so um, I grew from China showed this in about 2015, but they only looked for a few of the PFAS. So we wanted to see if we could extend that to more of these emerging PFAS. And um, we went around and sampled around North Carolina and picked trees and needles from areas around our airports and areas around that chemical manufacturer. And we'd get unshed needles and then shed needles. And then we'd uh, dry them. We slow dried them in an oven. And so every day we'd measure them to see if their water had gone down. And once they hit a static weight, then we ground them up in a coffee grinder and then extracted the different chemicals out of the needles. But we found 76 different PFAS throughout North Carolina. So not all in the same tree. I think our most contaminated tree had 25. Um, but from all different types of PFAS kind of groups. And so you can see all these different crazy backbone structures of the PFAS. And so nothing was selective. Like everything bound in that nice waxy um, outside, which was pretty interesting. And if we looked at previous studies, they'd only seen, they'd mainly focused on this PFCAs and only seen, you know, zero to one of, and maybe three to four of some of these other classes. So we really extended the knowledge that pine trees and a lot of these trees, you can even see them in leaves of trees, but that wax on the pine trees and eucalyptus trees actually work really well for cont or capturing contaminants. Um, this was our most contaminated source, which was the Raleigh-Durham -Dur International Airport. It is near, or the North Carolina National Guard is also there. And this is the tree we got it from. So the trees look really nice and happy. They're just grabbing those nasty chemicals out of the air. But a lot of training goes on here. And so you can see we saw some really interesting cyclic PFAS. And here we had two to four orders of magnitude higher concentrations of certain classes of the PFAS, so really high levels. We also went back because people asked us if we could use historical samples to kind of use this as a toxin or toxicant type of dating. And so we went to herbaria samples and we're able to see how like these samples from 1961 only had a couple of the legacy PFAS. And then throughout time, we could see that the emerging PFAS started to come in. But the scary thing is here we're detecting two PFAS in the sample from 1961. That shows us that these two PFAS are lasting for over 60 years. So they definitely are forever chemicals. And then just a few other things to show you guys is that we worked on a project with the Intercontinental Terminal Fires Company where they had a huge fire. It was a huge chemical fire. And so in order to get the fire out, they had to import 5 million liters of AFFFs to spray it down. And this fire was right near, um, it was in Houston, and it was right near the Galveston Bay. And so this is where the company was. And we started taking water samples just to see the contamination of that area. 
And the two main chemical or two main PFAS in those, we could see that at the time of the fire, the red is the highest level. And so we can see that we had really high levels at the time of the fire, which makes sense. But throughout time, like three months later, the PFAS had mainly cleared. But if we started looking lower down and in the Galveston Bay, we could see these levels were very high for these chemicals. So basically, they're just diluting from where they were spread and moving to different areas for contamination. And then this is the part I told you, if you guys don't remember anything from my talk, this is just kind of our fun little vignette. So we're also working with alligators as sentinels for human exposure. And so um, alligators are really interesting because they're long lived, so they can live over 60 years. They're apex predators like people. So basically they dominate their environment and um, they also share habitat for people. So if the alligators get sick, we can kind of think of this as like the canary in the gold mine of like, oh dear, the alligators are sick. They're in our water. Like what's gonna happen to us next? And so um, blood PFAS levels have also been linked to autoimmune-like effects in alligators. And so they've seen that alligators that have wounds, maybe they got bit or something, often heal normally very, very, very quickly. When we looked at alligators with high levels of PFAS, the wounds were still open. So that it was kind of an interesting correlation. And so to kind of show you guys some fun stuff, um, everybody always asks, well, how do you collect the alligators? And the, no alligators are harmed either, so we don't kill the alligators. But to collect the alligators' samples, first you spot the alligator. So a lot of times they'll be roaming around in the pond with their head up or their back up. And then um, we use fishing poles with hooks on the end. And so you try to cast over the top of the alligator and then reel in and basically hook the back of the alligator and reel them to either the dock or the shore where you're where you're working. And then as we reel them in, you can see this little guy coming over the dock, then you'll hook them. Um, and uh, then we quickly <laughs> tape their mouths. And so we work with people that are experts in this though. It's not just um, random grad students <laughs> doing this. And the smaller they are, we use electrical tape. If they're bigger, we'll use duct tape to tape off their mouths. And then you sit on the alligators. This guy was a little guy. So I just put my hand on him and I, I, I like to hold his little claw as he was getting his blood sampled. But um, you'll sit on, this was a, I think this was a nine footer. But we look for microchips, so we microchip every alligator that we collect, and then we take their blood and do all kinds of measurements. We'll measure their girth, we'll, um, we have to sex them and figure out whether they're male or female, and, um, and then we also look them over really carefully and note if they have any open wounds or bacterial infections that we can see visually. And so then we also uh, mark them. So we mark them with a yellow, or sorry, an orange marker, because once we catch them that day, we don't want to catch them again. And so the marker lasts for a, about a week on them. And so we can see that orange floating in the lake and then we release them. And so you can see this bigger guy, this guy was an easy one to release. We could just pick him up and toss him over the dock. But this one was a bigger one, a little bit feistier. So we hooked a rope onto that tape. And as everybody got off, you pull the rope and that breaks the tape free and then the alligator runs off. But it's kind of a fun project because we do a lot of field sampling. And so we have a little lab in the back of a pickup where we can centrifuge and um, separate like the, when we take the blood samples, we'll separate the red blood cells out from the plasma and the serum. And then we have dry ice so that we, or, or liquid nitrogen so that we can quickly fast freeze the samples so that we don't, if we wanna do like lipidomic or metabolomic um, measurements, we don't have that metabolism going on all day be until we get back to the lab. And so uh, we're doing a lot of work here where, again, we're playing around chemors, and this is our little alligator again. He is kind of mad. He's marching off. Um, uh, but we have a, we call it a clean site. It's our control site where it's not being um, polluted directly from the chemical manufacturer. There's probably, there are PFAS, we know there's PFAS in here, but it's a lot cleaner than this Cape Fear River area. And then we also have other, and then when we're taking alligators from this known contaminated site, and then also comparing those to coastal North Carolina alligators and Florida alligators. And so um, if you guys are interested in about six months, we should have results for this study. So if you get to see a chance um, to see me talk, I'll, I'll be able to show you what we found in the alligators of um, different PFAS or different regions. And 
Um, but right now we have 191 plasma samples, which is pretty good because just collecting one alligator sample, as you can imagine, takes probably about an hour to get the alligator in, get the sample, get the alligator out, you know, get ready for the next alligator. So it's been a lot of work, but um, we're super excited about the results. And I'm just going to skip through that one. And then just, um, I hope I've been able to show you that uh, what ion mobility is as an analytical technique, but how we're using it in other applications to really show the power of having these multidimensional analyses in a lot of our exposure-based um, studies. And our goal is basically to take um, your pre basically before you're born, your exposure, and then try and link it to your outcomes. And whether that's job-based or whether that's dietary-based, we want to be able to inform people more about um, choices that might help them out. So big thanks to everybody for listening. These are my group and my funding sources, and I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has, has any. Just Great. Sharing. Well, thank you so much um, for chatting with us. That was a really exciting um, and interesting talk. So um, <laughs> I'm sure everyone loved it. Um, I loved it. So um, yeah, anyone who needs to head off now um, is, you know, obviously free to go. Um, and for those of you that want, um, I think now we'll jump into some questions. Um, so yeah, time for questions now.